Um, next up, we have a special session presented by our underwriter, Accenture, on empowering student borrowers with human-centered design and service design. In this session, we will also we'll ask Jessica Barrett's system to rejoin us, um, and she'll be joined by Michael Lawless, who's the managing director and studio lead at Accenture Federal Digital Studio. They'll take a deeper dive into how studentloans.gov empowered borrowers with great design. I'm fascinated by this as someone who spent days on my FAFSA forms in the early 90s. Michael, please join us on stage. Please join me in welcoming Michael to the stage. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Well, good morning. And uh, that was fascinating to, to watch you and Michelle talk about some of these things. And it, and it brought a couple of things with what Tim mentioned and what Elaine described. Some of these things came into focus. And, when we think of the kind of design work that we do with the federal government with, and, and work with so many clients, we think of what the, happens for the citizens, and we describe the front stage experience of those interactions that people have with all of those services. And then those have to work with the backstage elements, all the technology that has to work in the background to make the, bring those things to life. And when we think of bringing together all of those elements in an entire ecosystem, and weaving it together, the part that excites me is about how we figure all those things out, those intricacies. But we also face a number of challenges. Um, a lot of times that, that we're dealing with, um, with people who, who might not have the, um, the consumer-facing roles. Um, they might have more technical experience. So there's some challenges. And I want to couple, focus on a couple of things um, in our discussion. Um, the first part I would like to understand a little bit from you um, in the work with um, uh, the student loans and, and with uh, FSA, how we actually think about some of those internal cultural challenges um, that you face when you're dealing with people who might not traditionally work with your, um, the consumer-facing um, parts of the organization. They might be technical experts, but they might not have that experience. And I think there's some cultural challenges. So I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on those. I think one of the things that we've realized is how important it is to listen to our customer up front when we're mm -hmm. making some of those design decisions. Um, so as we were working with Accenture um, on uh, studentloans.gov and making it mobile responsive, uh, we, instead of, you know, what FSA has, has done in many cases is at the very end of after we've designed something, we've done, you know, user acceptance testing and, and it's then yeah. that maybe we identify some of the issues that we, that we didn't know about in the beginning, um, we started with uh, listening to our customer and with doing some of that user research up front. Um, for example, we did card sorting exercises where we were um, you know, trying to figure out how do you group um, different categories, um, what things make sense, what terms um, resonate with our customers, um, how are we going to set up the navigation for the site. Um, so we did, we did some of that up front. Um, and I think that that is really important. I think it's also very important to um, place more of a value on research and data. Mm -hmm. uh, and we talked a little bit about that in the first session, um, but we do customer satisfaction surveys. Um, we look a lot at our website analytics. Um, and that data is really important for figuring out where the customer pain points are at. I think when you're talking about kind of a cultural shift, uh, I think especially for a lot of us who worked in government for a long time, I mean, I've been here uh, at our, my agency for 10 years, but there are many people that have been here for 20, 30 years, um, and I think we assume that we know what our customers want. Um, and in some cases, that's, that's based on our own experience or maybe our family's experience or others that we've talked to. Um, but there, there are parts of the experience that we are not familiar with and that we really need to make sure that we are looking at that data and testing and validating our assumptions mm -hmm. um, against that data. Um, I've worked on a number of email campaigns also with Accenture um, for borrowers to try to make sure that we are getting information out about uh, repayment options. Um, and we use some of our segmentation uh, data and we also did A-B testing where we were trying to see, okay, if we change this one little thing in our communications, uh, does that lead to more of um, a response? Do we, do we get a better response um, by doing that? And I, I love doing the testing and the experimentation because I think in a lot of cases, it, it, it shows us how little that we actually know. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, it does challenge some of those assumptions that I think we hold about, we know what the customer wants. And in many cases, we don't. Uh, that's great. I, I love that kind of the three things that challenge your assumptions. Um, by rely on the testing and the data to really tell you the, the information. Um, and then 
um, th this, uh, this rigor rigorous approach across the entire length of what you're doing, um, uh, it, it's the whole, that life cycle, whether it's what you described to being the student um, life cycle of how they engage with that go going to get student aid, but it's the entire life cycle of that experience and dealing with the stuff that's happening in that front stage that the consumers or the, the citizens are experiencing, but also those things that are happening behind the curtain, as it were, mm -hmm. the lights and the sound that allow this to come to life. That's, that's good. So the, um, the next thing, though, um, is and when I was, I was writing some notes about this, and I was thinking about the challenge that many of us face, and the people in this room are generally focused on, you know, they, they, they understand the UX world and how they, you, you, you go with that approach of being UX-led. But the other folks are the, that we work with oftentimes, they're not used to that. They're used to using the functional requirements uh, approach, where they have mm -hmm. the, we've described that as an inside-out approach versus that outside in where you're thinking about the consumers, the end users so much. Um, when, when you think about that kind of um, uh, split and the challenge of working with that, can you describe some of the things that, that you've done to overcome some of those um, barriers potentially that exist within an organization that, that, that might resonate with some of the folks here? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think uh, one of the challenges has been for us is to change the way that we do project management um, and the way that we manage change. Uh, and you know, we've shifted from more of a waterfall approach to more of an agile approach uh, and working with our developers to, um, and, and our designers to do more of the iterative sprints um, on some of the um, improvements that we've been making. Uh, as an example, we worked with uh, Accenture and with the US Digital Service uh, to design a tool on studentloans.gov uh, that is, is sort of a quiz that asks uh, five questions and it's supposed to guide you towards your right um, repayment plan. Um, so should you go into income driven repayment? Should you, um, would you be qualified for uh, public service loan forgiveness? Um, maybe you should pay down your loans faster. Maybe you should sign up for auto debit. Um, it asks you a series of questions about yourself and your, your goals. And we really did a lot of um, testing and a lot of um, thinking behind what the questions were and the direction that we are trying to guide folks. Because uh, financial aid and student loan repayment is very complex. Mm -hmm. uh, people get very confused and trying to take all of the information and all of the options that we have and condense it down into five questions um, was uh, really a challenge. And, but we were able to do it. It's something that we did over the course of several weeks um, with US Digital Service. And we did over 50 one-on-one -on -one usability studies. Hmm. Um, we did 19 designs using paper prototypes and 12 designs um, with digital prototypes. Uh, and the US Digital Service really, I think, was a good case study for us to observe this in action mm -hmm. um, for FSA to see how to do this. Uh, they, the way that they recruited people for these usability studies, um, the way that they did the prototyping, um, it was really a good learning experience for us and something that we realized we could do more of um, and that it didn't necessarily require the kind of investment that we assumed that it did mm -hmm. or the amount of time that we thought it was going to take. Um, so those, those were some surprises that, that, for us. It, it's interesting you have this internal validation of so many of these tools. You've mentioned a, a handful between you and Michelle. You had at least six or so that, uh, of these different tools, card sorts and personas, um, mm -hmm. and, and then the different types of interviewing techniques. So using that as the validation. Mm -hmm. um, now I want to shift gears a little bit because we often talk, talk about barriers. And one of the things that I like to look at are these moments of delight. And when I say delight and we think of, you know, nobody's going to be delightful when they when they're filling out a form to get student aid, but those moments of unexpected satisfaction that we all encounter, whether we're dealing with services or um, in our everyday um, uh, experiences. So I'd like you to maybe pick out one of those that you can um, share with everybody about the experiences you have. It might be on the, um, the student loans, some of those other pieces that you've done, because I think we can learn a lot, gain some insight in those moments of delight. Mm -hmm. So as we were working with the US Digital Service and we were working on this um, studentloans.gov slash repay tool, this um, quiz, um, we, we are typically used to doing some of these uh, customer surveys that require OMB clearance and it's a, a lengthy process to get some of this customer feedback. Um, one of the things that we figured out was that 
um, we could do some of this prototyping and do some of these one-on-one -on -one interviews um, without necessarily needing to go through any kind of OMB clearance for it. So okay. that was a little bit of a surprise and, and a delight, I must say. <laughs> yeah, so the, the OMB clearance of uh, nine people, if you go to more than nine people, you got to get special. Right. Well, also yeah. the, the idea that you, if you're asking the same questions that you need to get um, those that cleared, but that if you're just having a conversation and you're saying, okay, you know, where, what, what makes sense to you when you look at this? Does this, do you understand what these words are? Where would you go first? Um, did you see this button up here? That as you're having a conversation, um, that that is something that uh, you can do at any time um, mm -hmm. and with more than 10 people. Um, and that it's not something that you need to get like an interview, you know, set of questions cleared to do that kind of work. So that, that was a surprise um, to us. Uh, we also have we have a generic clearance that we use for our customer satisfaction surveys, mm -hmm. um, and that's been something that we've really we've taken advantage of because we don't have to go through the full clearance. But for things like online surveys, um, where we're trying to just gauge customer satisfaction and, and ask just a, a few questions about the the digital experience, that we're able to get feedback that way. Um, and so cutting through some of those processes that can be lengthy. And you know, I worked in customer analytics. We did a lot of surveys and. Um, some of the, some of that process, um, realizing that we can get some of that customer feedback in a little bit more of a quick and easy way, um, has been a surprise, and we're figuring out better ways to do that. Wow, I I, I think that may be one of the things that everybody here will want to take away because that <laughs> idea of having to go through the OMB guidelines for speaking with consumers to get that valuable insight can be off-putting. Um, I want to go back to we have a little more time. I want to go back to one of the other pieces that you you mentioned. You talked about this. Um, the, the idea of moving from waterfall to agile and integrating the design elements into that agile environment. Um, and that's something that's relatively cutting edge. Um, the pure form of agile assumes that when you're building your epics and your user stories, that you're going to have that insight. But so many times I describe what we encounter a lot of times as water scrum fall of the approach to. It's really it's just taking the waterfall approach and kind of reconfiguring it so it's done quicker. Um, and yeah, we're calling it agile. But I'm, I'm interested to hear about this, the work that you did to make sure that you were embedding those design features or the design steps into that agile approach, because I think that's something that will resonate with many other groups who are trying to do the same thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, right now we're, we're working on that with one of our websites, um, and we're doing it in sprints. Um, and we're focusing on specific areas of the site that we know uh, our users are going to and that um, are of high value for us. Mm -hmm. and. We're identifying, you know, these are the main improvements that we think that we want to do, but we we first then go out and take our prototypes and do talk to users and get that mm -hmm. feedback and then meet again, go through it, make some changes um, and iterate on that, um, and then end up with the final design after we've had those um, those interactions with the users and we've gotten their feedback on it. Um, so we're, we're doing that in sprints. We're focusing on, on those specific areas, um, and it's just something that I think we're going to continue to do uh, as part of our uh, standard operating procedures. And are you able to incorporate all the, the research elements into each one of those sprints, or are you doing that mainly at the beginning? We're doing it um, as we go along. Okay. So it's, yep. it's mainly in the beginning, mm -hmm. um, but it, it, we're, we're talking to the users as we go along So as you well. can build on the ideas, and, and ideally you're reducing that backlog because you're identifying those things as you go through that process. Right. That's, that's fascinating. Um, so th we have, uh, I think, uh, just a couple more minutes, but I wanted to um, get your take on a couple of other things because one of the pieces you mentioned was this move to mobile across mm -hmm. so many different aspects. Mm -hmm. I think you mentioned three different kind of phases of your mobile work. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that when we were talking uh, uh, over the last couple of weeks, you mentioned one of the successes that you've had with some of that mobility. And because so many of our, um, our public sector um, uh, agencies are now trying to move to the mobile arena. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about some of the things that you've learned as you've been trying to move from that environment of uh, web primary focus to the mobile responsive environments? Mm -hmm. I think what we talk about is with government, we've sort of had this evolution from, you know, we used to have a paper FAFSA, and then we thought it, we made a great improvement by just making it electronic. And we mm -hmm. just took the paper and we put it online and, and made it electronic and said, all right, we, we're done. But now we're, we're going through an evolution where, you know, we've introduced skip logic, we've got the mm -hmm. IRS data retrieval tool, um, we've, we've changed the date on FAFSA to make it earlier so that you could um, have your tax information available earlier and apply for college earlier. 
Um, but you're right, there's a shift towards mobile first and mm -hmm. designing for mobile first. Um, and we're, we're trying to make sure that our, all of our websites um, are mobile responsive. You asked earlier about barriers. Um, I think one of the things that so surprised me, and, and I guess maybe should not, is that there's a generation gap uh, sort of in government and with our mm -hmm. customers in particular. We serve a lot of younger customers. Um, some of the people who are coming to us are just straight out of high school. They might be 18 to 24. Uh, and in our agency, we don't. We don't have very many people who are in that age range, um, and the behaviors, the, the communication preferences, the use of technology, um, some of the habits that we have are different from mm -hmm. that generation. And so I've encountered a lot of skepticism that people would actually do things on their mobile device, um, that they would come to us and want to fill out the FAFSA on their mobile device, or that they would want to do loan counseling on their mobile device um, within, within my own agency that 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 is something that people would do or that they should do. Um, there's mm -hmm. still sort of the, well, you should do it on a desktop and that, you know, it's a long process and they need all of these other things. Um, but I think really our customers are expecting to be able to do those processes on a mobile device and we have to meet their expectations. And so uh, my approach to that has been um, to use data and to show mm -hmm. that uh, if you look at these different tasks, if you look at loan counseling, uh, we had, I think we had over 7 million um, people do loan counseling on our studentloans.gov website last year. If you if you look at the trends in um, mobile, uh, you'll see that more and more people are doing it on a mobile device. And even with our digital communications, and we look at email uh, and the number of people who are opening up our emails on a mobile device, it's over half. Uh, so we really have to be designing with that in mind. Um, and we, we've tried to use some of that data and show those, those trends in order to um, convince others that that is something that, that that's what's on the horizon and that's what our customers expect of us. Yeah, so we come right back to that, the first thing you were stressing of challenging our assumptions. And, and not only challenging our assumptions, but allowing the data from the research that we do or from the metrics that we gather from actual behaviors in the market inform our decisions and, and use that to prove across the broader part of the organization. So I think that's, that's fascinating, it's really helpful learning. Um, so I think that uh, we're, we're, we're now at the end, so uh, are we going to do questions or are we going? Okay, we're in. <laughs> but thank you very much for this component. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Hey.